Welcome back to Landmarks Discovered. In this episode, we'll take you to 234 Phipps Plaza, which served as Maurice Fascio's office from 1927 to 1943. During the 1920s, Phipps Plaza was really the center of commercial activity in town in many ways, especially when it came to design. Sure, so Phipps Plaza was designed and named after its owner, John S. Phipps, and Bessemer Properties was really the leading force of property sales here in Palm Beach during that time. And at one point, the Phipps family owned over one third of the land on the island of Palm Beach. And what's interesting about Phipps Plaza is there are buildings that represent every major architect that worked in Palm Beach during the period. And also, some of the major architects had their offices there. For instance, we know John Volk had his office there at 206 Phipps Plaza. Belford Shoemate had his office at the end of the plaza. And Maurice Fascio's office was located at 234. Phipps Plaza. Phipps Plaza was really a locus for design professionals during the boom times. And when we separate out Maurice Fascio's office, we can really see that it's the creative center of his work. I agree. And I think that you can take that and extrapolate it to Phipps Plaza itself, that not only was 234 the place where some of the estates many of the estates that we know and love were designed and created. It's also the place where so many other buildings within the town that are landmarks today were imagined and put on paper. So even though uh, 234 Phipps Plaza is this French Norman style, we see a lot of the detailing that we see in Mediterranean Revival style homes. For instance, the Cuban tile floors, the pecky cypress ceilings, and the pine paneling that is found in the office that originally was Fascio's office. And I think that goes back to Maurice Fascio saying himself that he is an eclectic architect by taking the best of each European style and pulling it together, mainly because the town kind of rejected modern. Yes. And it's almost as if 234 Phipps Plaza was a study in the French Norman style that he would then apply the following year when he designed 210 Via Del Mar, which is recognized as, I think, the highest example of the style within the town. Originally, 234 Phipps Plaza had an exterior stairwell that connected the first floor to the residence above. And we know that Maurice Fascio had his offices on the first floor and originally inhabited that apartment on the second floor before relocating shortly after he married Eleanor to 930 South Ocean Boulevard. And what's interesting about the second story as well is in the original drawings, you can see a balcony, and that at one point that was removed. The owners in the early 2000s replaced the balcony and kind of restored the facade to its former glory. One of the notable things about 234 Phipps Plaza is the amount of original detailing that's still extant in the building. For instance, when you go to approach the front door, it's quite obviously the original door, and above it is a transom window that still has the original address in gold lettering. We can see in some of the old photos of the building that just to the left of the door was the name of the firm, Trainer and Fascio. When you enter the home, it has 
really beautiful colored tile flooring. And in the study, or Maurice's office, there's actually some very highly detailed wrought iron light fixtures that we believe are original to the home. The room also has hand-painted detailing along the crown molding, and there is actually a hand-painted medallion that almost has a laurel leaf design in the center of the room where the chandelier is located. In one of the articles we found from 1927 announcing his new offices at 234 Phipps Plaza, it mentions that he was going to reside in the apartment located above. And one of the things that Fascio is known for is his incredible work ethic. And we can see in the letters that he wrote to, him to his family in Switzerland, he really, it's amazing how hard he did work. And one of the things that we commented about is when did he ever sleep? I know, it was really interesting because his office alone was open from basically seven in the morning to 11 or midnight. And he kind of had two shifts of working architects going. And really at the height at that office, they had about 25 employees there. And you know, back to Maurice Fascio's work ethic, when his office was built um, in 1927, that was just one of 19 commissions. And by 1929, in that three-year period, he had done 60 commissions in the town of Palm Beach alone. That's incredible. And, and my, I, it makes me recall that historic image that we have of his firm standing in front of this office. One of the people pictured in the photograph in front of the office with all of the employees of the firm is actually Byron Simonson, who is an architect who is best known for his work on buildings like the Colony Hotel. And he actually occupied the office at 234 Phipps Plaza after Maurice's death in 1943. In our last episode, we featured 930 South Ocean Boulevard, which was the first home that Maurice and Eleanor Fascio lived in as newlyweds. We had the opportunity to interview Debbie Murray, who's the chief curator of collections at the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. In this episode, we'll continue the second part of her interview. So some of his first projects were up in what we call Hope Sound area, Jupiter Island. Um, that was a booming area at the time. They tried to make it a Hollywood East. We already had a Hollywood East in Jacksonville at the very same time, but they were trying to bring the film industry further south. And at the same time, there was a consortium uh, trying to build up Jupiter Island as a resort for the wealthy. Not as big as Palm Beach, but a quiet resort. And that's how Fascio was introduced to Florida. By the mid-1930s, both of them had had some severe illnesses. And Eleanor wrote often about how she was trying to beef up Maurice and because he would get very thin. He ended up having some radiation treatments about 1935, um, the same year that she apparently started having to be treated for depression. So yeah, we think of them as, you know, a party every night, Houses going up. At times he had, you know, 30 houses going at a time, not only here, but in New York and around. And his partner trainer was not really healthy. So he was, he felt he had the burden of both offices on him and the burden of making sure those payrolls were met. Um, it, it, that's stress. You know, they didn't, they didn't recognize that at the time, but that's definitely high stress situations. As you know, in the mid 30s, this area was suffering by that time from the, from the Great Depression. Fascio and his wife had moved into this house at 930 South Ocean Boulevard. So Maurice is trying to find work. All the architects in Palm Beach are trying to find work. Commissions dry up. Maurice Fascio actually got some commissions in South America, both in Chile and in Brazil. I think his last one was in 1940 in Brazil. But in the meantime, a group of architects from Florida called, they got themselves organized into a group called Florida Associates and they took undertook commissions from the government to help build and des design and build airport runways, barracks buildings, and other types of government facilities across the state. Um, and that kept a lot of them in food through the late 1930s and into the early 1940s. 
Now, Maurice was well-educated, grew up in Switzerland, so he spoke fluent English, French, German, and Italian. Um, lots of talent, still had contacts in Switzerland. You know, after 1938, we all know, everybody knows that they're going to war in Europe just a matter of time. 1939 comes, they are in New York. Or actually, they were in Vermont when they got the news that the Germans had invaded Poland. So Maurice kept up his contacts throughout Switzerland, especially in Bern. And while he had been working with the Florida Associates, he'd gotten to know some other government types um, that had their, their businesses in Washington, D.C., one of whom was Wild Bill Donovan. Um, who started the OSS, or Office of St Strategic Services. And by, 19, by June of 1943, Maurice was working full-time with them. And so on this side of the ocean, it appears, because not all the records are open yet, that Maurice was working on getting people's backgrounds checked. Unfortunately, by October of 1943, um, Eleanor got a call from one of Maurice's doctors in Washington, D.C., asking her to come as quickly as she could. She was in Oshkosh, and Maurice was ill, and they did surgery. They, he'd had a problem with his right arm. He just thought it was a gland. They told him they took out a gland, but they took out the gland. They tested it and found cancer. They also found cancer in his lungs. Now, for the last... 12, 11, 12 years that they had been to, together and all the years of going to the doctors, she'd always been worried about his smoking. He was an inveterate smoker. You see photographs of, of, of him, every photograph you see, he's got a cigarette in his hand. In um, one of the biographies recently written, recently in the last 15 years, about Eleanor, she apparently tried to get him to smoke pipes instead because that's more work, it slows down with the intake. With a cigarette, all you have to do is open the pack and smoke it. Um, that didn't work. He had pipes, but he didn't like them. So, unfortunately, he did end up with lung cancer. Um, and by December, he was dead. If we didn't know about Maurice Fascio, his background, his education, where he came from, how can we understand who he was by the time he was working in the Palm Beaches? Um, he, you bring all of your baggage with you, good, bad, and ugly. And I think he brought the good. He brought happiness to so many people who lived in his homes. He brought a lot of happiness to his family. So that's got to reflect in your work. Thank you for joining us for Landmarks Discovered. On our next episode, we'll continue our exploration of the important landmark properties within the town of Palm Beach. Elevating homes to protect them from water damage may seem like a new concept within the town, but it's actually something that was done more than a decade ago. In our next episode of Landmarks Discovered, we'll take you to 181 Clarendon, which was one of the first homes to be lifted. I hope you'll join us. If you enjoyed this episode of Landmarks Discovered, make sure to visit our YouTube page and subscribe to our channel to receive notice when we post new episodes. Mm -hmm.